I greet you in Christ's name. It's a good morning to be together. You know I have to say it. You know I do. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Amen. The sermon today is titled, Whose Opinion Matters? And our text is 1 Corinthians 4, verses 1 to 5. The story is told of a young man who had just gotten to be uh, good at his piano. He had uh, taken a lot of classes, a lot of training as a concert pianist. And his first public performance was given in this large concert hall. And everybody loved it. He did a really, really good job. Everybody gave him a great round of applause as he finished up his, his performance. As he went backstage, the, the, the clapping continued, the applause continued, and his manager back there said, go back out, young man, and receive the applause of the audience. And he said, I'm not going back. I'm not going back out there. She, he said, why not? Everybody loved it. Go back out there. Take a bow. He said, not everybody loved it. He said, take a peek. And the manager went and peeked through the curtains. And way up on the balcony, there was one man who was not standing and applauding. The young man said, That's, that was my teacher. And he wasn't applauding. He said, I'm not going back out there. Whose opinion matters to you? It didn't matter to that concert artist what the crowd thought. Only one opinion mattered. It was only one person who he really wanted to please in that audience. And you know, that's the way that God has wired us. You may not realize it, but God has wired us to please him. And there's only one person that really uh, we need to strive to please above all others. And that is our creator, our master, our teacher. Sadly, we tend to lose sight of him in our desire to get the applause of the crowd. Jesus lived only for his father's approval. And I think, as I shared a couple of weeks ago, the highlight in Jesus' experience was when he was baptized and he received the approval of his father. He came back out of the water and, and, and the, the Holy Spirit uh, came down and, and he received that sign of approval. And, he, and God said, you are my son. You are my beloved son. In you, I am well pleased. And I think that was what he was looking for. And, and that's an important reminder to us approval junkies. I won't ask you for a raise of hands, but there are some of us who, who just live for, for people's approval. We want to receive approval. That's really, really important to us. It's like we have a ticket in our hand and we go around and asking for people to validate it, please. Would you punch my ticket? Would you punch my ticket? Do you like what I'm doing? What do I have to do to get you to stamp my ticket? But there's never enough applause. There is never enough applause. There's never enough approval. And somewhere in all that pleasing, you lose yourself. And you lose the pleasure of the only one who can satisfy your heart. Your Lord Jesus, who died so that you could live for him. So who are you living to please? This is not just a rhetorical question, folks. This is a real question. Who are you living to please? Is it your, is it your friends? Are they the ones that, that you're trying to please? Your boss, your peers, your neighbor, your pastor? They didn't die for you. Their rewards don't hand a, hold a, a candle to his reward. The early church leader, Stephen, knew that. He had stood up for the truth on the streets of Jerusalem and the crowd was not applauding. They were screaming at him, throwing rocks at him to shut him up once and for all. But the Bible says Stephen looked up to heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. 
You know, Jesus, Bible says, is sitting on the right hand of the Father. But that time when Stephen looked up there, he was standing. Jesus was standing. What was he doing standing? He was doing this. That's it. Way to go, Stephen. Way to go, Stephen. And Stephen saw that. And it gave him courage, even at the cost of his life. I hope that's where you're looking for your approval. The only applause that matters is the applause of heaven. Anything is worth doing to get it. Nothing is worth losing it. You know, we, we spend our lives going through life constantly being judged by others. Some of you are conscious of that. Some of you are not. We're constantly being approved or disapproved by people that we know. We're receiving some type of response. Sometimes it's not the judgment itself that we dislike as much as it is the person that's doing the judging. We would prefer to be our own judge. We don't want someone else to evaluate us. But whose opinion is the most important to us? That's the question for the message this morning. Whose opinion is the most important? Is it the people around us? Is it our own opinion? Or is it God's opinion? You know, as parents, we are told to bring up our children in the fear of God. And that is really, really good advice. We are instructed to bring up our children in the fear of God. And they are to be made conscious of the one that really, really matters in their lives. Yeah, other people matter. But the most important person, the most important influence, the most important person in a child's life will end up being God. And we need to point them to God as they grow up. And a healthy fear of God or a healthy respect, a healthy sense that God is there. Our context this morning for the message from our text is that of the evaluation of teachers and preachers. There were so many teachers and preachers in Corinth. And there were favorites there. And the Corinthian church was rallying around different preachers and different teachers. And Paul, I think, was trying to get them to make a good evaluation of who those, who those were in the, that they were surrounding, that they were surrounding, yes. And we could take a special application from that passage for, for preachers and teachers. But I want to apply it this morning to all of us. If we are faithful to God in the things he asks of us, then we don't have to worry so much about the opinion of others. The important thing is that we get his approval. The word picture that I want to draw from this morning in this message is that of a court. There are three basic courts that Paul makes reference to in this passage of Scripture. There are three different courts. There is, and we want to look at them in turn. Who is my judge? Who is yours? Let's read our passage. If you have your Bibles open to 1 Corinthians 4, uh, we're going to read it from verse 1 to 5. And stand, if you would, to read as I read. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. You may be seated. There are three courts 
that are mentioned in this passage of Scripture. Three courts of judgment that render verdicts on each one of us. There's the court of public opinion, there's the court of self-evaluation, and then there is the Supreme Court. And we want to look at them in that, that order. The first one is the court of public opinion. The court of public opinion. Verse 3 of our text, it says, But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. I'd like to hone in on that phrase. It is a very small thing that I should be judged by you. Paul is saying that it's a very small thing. The court of public opinion is always in session. The court of public opinion is always in session. People are always evaluating others. They are admiring in their judgment or they are critical or they are indifferent. This is normal human behavior. Everybody, and that includes you all this morning in this auditorium, you are part of public opinion. You are the part of the court that I am being judged by, the court of public opinion. Everybody contributes to that. Every family, every church, every community. Christianity as a whole has an opinion. Our American culture has an opinion. The opinion keeps evolving. It is easy to almost unconsciously become a slave to the opinion of others. It's very easy to become a slave to the opinion of others. And I won't ask for a show of hands, but I will raise mine. It's so easy for me to become subject, become a slave to public opinion. I'm a people pleaser. That's not necessarily good. I, I, you want to please people. And it's so easy, it's a trap that gets in there that we really want to become a people pleaser. It was said of the former president, Bill Clinton, that he would put a finger to the wind to see which way the wind of public opinion was blowing before he made a decision. I believe it. He was a people pleaser. He would take his finger. You know how you, you actually take your finger and you can tell which way the wind is blowing? You stick it in your mouth and you get it wet and you stick it up and which side of the finger is cool, right? That's which way the wind is blowing. And the, many politicians, that's how they govern. And it's not a way to govern. I mean, it, is, it should not be the primary means of governance. It is public opinion. Bertrand Russell says, one should respect public opinion insofar it is, as it is necessary to avoid starvation and keep out of prison. But anything that goes beyond this is voluntary submission to an unnecessary tyranny. I wouldn't go as far as Bertrand Russell. But um, public opinion can be quite a master if we use a pu public opinion as our primary court. Proverbs 29 says, The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. And then our passage this morning. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. It's a very small thing by comparison. Public opinion was to Paul a small thing. It matters. Public opinion does matter, but not so much. It was not one of the larger concerns what other people thought. I, and I think I would like to challenge you this morning in this court of public opinion that you would take the approach of the Apostle Paul in that you would consider public opinion as a small thing. You don't want to disregard it. You don't want to become an idiot. You don't want to do stupid th stuff just because it ticks people off. You don't want to become weird necessarily for weirdness sake, okay? We do respect people the opinion of others, and especially of our brothers and sisters in Christ. We do respect that. It needs to be in the proper perspective. 
a quote from Alexander McLaren. And by the way, if you all are Bible students, I would recommend you getting the, uh, his commentary. Alexander McLaren was a Scottish pastor from the 19th century somewhere, I believe. And I, I got it, uh, a Kindle version of his, of his large commentary. And uh, he, I'm impressed with the man. He's not, he's not right theologically everywhere, but he does have some good thoughts. He says, there is a regard to man's judgment which is separated by the very thinnest partition from hypocrisy. Let me repeat that phrase because it's profound. There is a regard to man's judgment, which is separated by the very thinnest partition from hypocrisy. What the great commentator was saying is that if we are so obsessed with man's opinion, we become a hypocrite. We are in danger of becoming a hypocrite. We start becoming something that we're not to please other people. You get what I'm saying? We start living our lives pretending to be something we're not because it pleases people. And that's a danger. Hypocrisy is a danger. If you try to please everyone, you will do some strange stuff. I think you know what I'm saying. You try to please everyone, you're going to do some strange stuff. I have a story to relate to you. It's, it's humorous. Story is told of a man and his grandson traveling down the road, walking and leading a donkey. They met a man who said, how foolish for you to be walking. One of you should be on riding the donkey. So the man put his grandson on the donkey. And it kept on going. The next traveler they met frowned and said, how dreadful for a strong boy to be riding while the old man walks. So the boy climbed off the donkey and his grandfather climbed on. The next person they met said, I just can't believe a grown man would ride and make a little boy walk. So the man pulled the boy up and they rode the donkey together. That is, until they met another man who said, I never saw anything so cruel in all my life. Two human beings riding on one poor defenseless donkey. Down the road away, they met a couple of men. After they passed, one of the men turned to the other and said, Did you ever before see two fools carrying a donkey? <laughs> the opinions of others can make some, us do some weird stuff. Should we care about people's opinions? And I'm not opening this for discussion this morning, <laughs> okay? I'm going to give my opinion, and we'll leave it at that. Should you care about other people? Yeah, you should to a degree. We should care about people. We don't want to turn people away from Christ by our behavior. We don't want to offend in ways that turn people away from Christ. We should not be jerks or just plain ignorant in our behavior. We are part of the body of Christ in body life is important. We do need to be considerate of one another, but we should not care so much that our lives are ruled by the court of public opinion. I want you to think about that. I need to think about that, that our, our lives dare not be ruled absolutely by the court of public opinion. I'll do this just because people like it, especially if God doesn't like it. Jesus said in John 5, How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? John 12, Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. So it's something we need to be careful about. We can't please everyone. It's not possible. Man's opinion is not only of lesser importance, it is also ill-informed. Many people that would judge us, they don't know us. They can't see what we're going through. And we need to be careful when we form an opinion of others that we don't, um, we don't judge from the outside. We can't see inside as God can, as God, Jesus could. 
Job is a good example of that. Um, his opinion, he, he was more concerned with, man, with God's opinion than man's. His three friends gathered around him and said, basically, Joel, you, you've messed up. You're a sinner. Why would you be suffering like this if you weren't a sinner? And Job didn't, wasn't, wasn't concerned about their opinion. But when God spoke, Job, the Bible says that Job abhorred himself and repented in dust and ashes. He, his opinion, his um, evaluation of God's opinion was, was right on. Our relationship with Jesus Christ should be such that the approval of man pales before him. I receive my power from him. My stimulus comes from him. My rewards come from him. I receive my greatest approval from Jesus. And it's great to receive the approbation of people important to us, but our well-being is not dependent on it. There is a higher court than the court of public opinion. I think of Stanley's dad and Bev's dad, who we fully believe has gone through the pearly gates and he is in heaven. And the opinion of God on his life was more important than those around him. And his reward will be from his maker, his teacher, the great one, God. But with me, Paul says, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. So that's the first court that we look at this morning. The second one I've labeled the court of self-evaluation. The first one is the court of public opinion. The second one is the court of self-evaluation. And I take that from verse, uh, second half of verse 3 and verse 4 of our text. In fact, Paul says, I do not even judge myself. For I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. We have been given a conscience. We all know what that is. It's hard sometimes to explain it, but we've all been given a conscience. By, uh, and that conscience is there to help direct our lives. It's a gift from God. It monitors our behavior. It stands in judgments of motives, thoughts, and actions. It approves or disapproves what we have done or are contemplating doing. Romans 2 verse 14 says, For when the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. So that's our conscience. Each one of us has one. Paul says he had a clear conscience. It's a beautiful thing. A clear conscience, as you all know, is a beautiful thing. It's something that we strive for, is a clear conscience. He didn't know that there was anything there that was wrong. He didn't realize any wrong in his life. But he realized as well that we should, as we also should, that our conscience is not an absolute good authority. I had to learn that. You all need to learn that. Our conscience is a higher court of opinion than the opinion of those around us. But our conscience is not the highest court our conscience is not the highest court. It is an intermediate court, if you will. Acts 24, 16 says, So I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. 2 Corinthians 1, For our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we have behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God, and supremely so toward you. 1 Timothy 3, 8. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. It's good to do self-examination periodically. 
Galatians 6, 3 says, For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5 says, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or you do, do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless you indeed you fail to meet the test? So it's good to do self-introspection, self-examination, quiet time, and allow your conscience to speak. Some of us are so troubled by our conscience that we don't like quiet time. And some people that are out there keep themselves so busy with social activities and work and whatever it is so they don't have a quiet time to sit back and contemplate. That's not good. They're running from their conscience. They're running from their quiet time because they, they, don't, they don't think that the, the results of their introspection are going to be good. Some of you struggle with an oversensitive conscience. I have in the past. I've had a brother who, was, who struggled with it constantly, an oversensitive conscience, a conscience that just constantly was bothering him if he even happened to say something a little bit wrong. And that's, that's kind of a miserable place to be. It really is. Forever going back and apologizing to people about something that they didn't even know you said. They didn't even realize it. It can be that way. Our conscience must be calibrated. Your conscience needs to be calibrated. I don't know how many of you know what calibration is, but calibration is when you take an instrument and you fine-tune it to make it accurate. A lot of times we had, I know in the field that I used to work in, in aviation, we were really big on calibration. Everything had to be calibrated. Our meters, our, our measurements or whatever, we had to be able to trace those calibration standards back to the standards in D.C., where the National Bureau of Standards, whatever it's called again, was. And we had to calibrate our instruments back to that standard. Our conscience is no different. Our conscience must be calibrated. Sometimes your conscience bothers you when it shouldn't. Other times your conscience doesn't bother you when it should. It's out of calibration. Your conscience is out of calibration. We know quite a bit about the conscience. Number one, it's been given to us as a guide for right and wrong. It's one of the pieces of evidence that we did not come from monkeys. You know, I doubt that a monkey has a conscience. They just do, you know, yeah, anyway. Paul said that he persecuted the church in ignorance. He thought he was doing the right thing. Paul thought he was doing the right thing. His conscience needed to be shown the right way. His conscience needed to be recalibrated. Lack of obedience brings dullness to our conscience. Lack of obedience brings dullness to our conscience. All of you who have matured at all, know that this is true. When you don't obey your conscience and you continue to disobey your conscience, that conscience becomes less effective. It becomes seared. It becomes uh, hardened, if you will. And it can become so dull that it basically is useless. It's like walking over gravel with bare feet. Eventually, your feet get hardened and calloused, and you no longer feel those little gravels. Eventually, what used to hurt us will no longer do that. A quote from Tim Woodruff, he says, We live in a world that has shaped our priorities, skewed our perspectives, and taught us what to value. 
Rather than permitting God to challenge those values, to confront and replace them, a great deal of energy is expended in the attempt to win God's approval and support of the values that God detests. We don't want God to calibrate our conscience. Sometimes we just want God to approve. And God doesn't approve. We want God to baptize our standard of living, our pursuit of financial security, and our accumulation of money. We want his approval of large houses, large bank accounts, large credit limits. We want him to look at our consumer culture, our capitalistic dreams, and pronounce it is good. It is all theological smoke and mirrors, imposing on God a value system that is foreign to his very nature. It is culture dictating the shape of faith, and in this we are culture's collaborators. I just said a mouthful. And you need to think about this. I need to think about this. We want God to bless our conscience. We want God to bless our perspective on, on how we do things rather than looking for God's opinion. God's opinion is more important. Our consciences are a God-designed court of judgment and it is a higher level than the court of public opinion. As a court of judgment, our self-evaluation sometimes has issues. We are biased and give ourselves breaks. We can easily get lopsided in the judgment of ourselves. Paul said he didn't know any that was bothering, anything that was bothering his conscience, but that didn't mean there wasn't anything that shouldn't. He said, I have a clear conscience. This is Paul's testimony in our text. He, I have a clear conscience, but that doesn't, that doesn't exonerate me. That doesn't mean that I am clear. Our conscience has constantly to be calibrated and informed by the absolute truth of God's word. I want, you, I want to repeat that. Our conscience has to be constantly calibrated and informed by the absolute truth of God's word. That's one of the reasons we're here this morning is to recalibrate our conscience. God's word is absolutely true. And it's a calibration standard for our conscience. Some of us have a conscience in which we are bothered by things that shouldn't bother us. Others aren't bothered when they should be. I'll just give you an example. I struggled with my conscience when I left home. I come from a very conservative background. We were beachy Amish background and in a mission there in Belize. And I came up to go to college for a couple of years, and I went to buy my clothes. <laughs> Fortunately, I was a man, and I could do that. Anyway, I went to there, and, and uh, I saw this plaid shirt. How many of you would be bothered by wearing a plaid shirt? Probably nobody here. But I was. Stuff like that. Is it, is, it, is it informed by the Bible or is it something else that is bothering our conscience? Our conscience has to constantly be calibrated through reading God's word and being obedient to God's word. Paul says that his conscience did not condemn him. That was good. But he didn't totally trust his own conscience. So that's the second court that Paul mentions here in our text. The first one was the court of public opinion. The second one, the court of self-evaluation. The third court is the Supreme Court. That's a play on words. The Supreme Court is the third court. A lot of us are thinking about the Supreme Court these days, aren't we? Supreme Court, if we can believe the rumors and the leaked documents is going to rule on Roe v. Wade. And supposedly is going to overturn it. So the Supreme Court is out there 
and it's a court that's obviously higher than the other lower courts. The Supreme Court, from our text, it is the Lord, verse, the second half of verse 4, it is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. It is the Lord who judges me. Second Timothy 2, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Zephaniah 3, verse 16. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. God's opinion is the most important. God is the Supreme Court. George Mueller was once asked, what is the secret of your service for God? Mueller's response was this, there, is a day, there was a day when I died, utterly died, died to George Mueller, his opinions, preferences, tastes, and will. Died to the world, its approval or censure. Died to the approval or blame even of my brothers and friends. And since then I have studied to show myself approved only to God. This is the highest court. And as our dear brother passed on to be with the Lord this past week, he is standing in that court. We need to seek his approval, the approval that comes from God. What, God, what does God think of what we have done or will do in the future? Is God pleased? Does he approve? God's approval is the ultimate concern. God's approval, seeking to find out what it is that pleases him, needs to be the driving force in our decisions. He is the ultimate court. He is the ultimate judge. We are, as it were, in a great arena. Around us are many witnesses to what we do and how we fight the fight. Our own conscience is either blessing what we do or troubling us. But there is just one, one authority that matters ultimately. Hebrews 4, verse 12, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but we all naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. God's approval is all that matters in the end. Finally, God makes no mistake. That's the neat thing about in standing in judgment before God. God makes no mistake. Human courts make mistakes. God is holy. He's just. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. Nothing is missed or incorrectly interpreted. There is this fear of God that must be part of our lives and experience. He is the highest court. He will make the judgment that determines our future. Matthew 10, verse 27 says, What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. God is the ultimate judge. God cares about whether we lose a hair from our head. I've lost quite a number, and he knows how many. The God who will judge is our Heavenly Father. I'd like to wrap up with just a couple of thoughts. Whose opinion matters? Whose opinion will rule your life? Young person? Middle-aged, old person, whose opinion is the most important to you? 
Are the opinions of those around you important? Surely they are if, there's, if we're talking about the church. Their opinions are important. The world less so. But the opinion of God is the most important. Even our own conscience sometimes can be wrong. But it's God that will ultimately judge. Will you receive in the end a verdict from the one who matters the most? Welcome home. You good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. Shall we have a song at this time, please? <laughs>